Hi, I'm Alver Berg, and the title of our topic is Walking with God. When I think about this topic itself, it really excites me to think that we people, common, ordinary, everyday people can actually walk with God. And you know, when I, I think about walking with somebody, I think about two things. One, I think about two people going the same direction. And secondly, I think about them so close together they can just reach out and hold hands. So when I think about our topic, walking with God, I think about you and God side by side going the same direction down the same path in life. If anything, God is just a little bit up ahead clearing the way to make your walk, your life, that much easier. When we stop to think it through what that really means, then isn't it really something that as Christians often we like to walk the path ourself and kind of go our own way and do our own thing, walk in the dark, bump into the obstacles, sprain our ankles, tumble over the obstruction in the path, when going through life the easy way, which is God's way, we can simply walk with him moment by moment, step by step. He walks up ahead. We hold his hand. He leads the way. And how simple it is. Well, as I think about this, I'm thinking about it from sort of a twofold point of view. One is, of course, I'm thinking about it as a family task. A family ought to walk with God, and certainly we're going to say some things about that in this little seminar series so that we can see what it is to have a family devotion, the place of it, the significance of it in the home. But in order for us to do this as a family, of course, there's the leader, typically the father, and the leadership might be on a share basis of father and mother. And when it comes down to it, if a family is going to walk with God, first of all, the leader has to walk with God. Now we're going to take this little seminar booklet and break this down, go through it a step at a time and see if we can really put together some beneficial things that are just going to enrich your whole relationship with God. And I know this, that if that's enriched, your whole life is going to change. Things are going to look differently to you. They're just going to feel better. And there's going to be something about life that's going to begin to ring and a sparkle that probably you have never seen before, unless you are already walking closely with him. Take your little seminar booklet, which you have, and may I ask you not to page ahead of me and not to come on behind. If there's something on a page that really struck you and you're just putting some second and third thoughts into it, don't do it because you're going to miss out on something else. You can always go back over the seminar booklet again. I know, too, that if you're doing this as a group, you will have a lot of things to talk about and work through because in this amount of time that we spend on this, we try to give you the guidelines and the insight of how to put this all together, but we leave a lot of room for discussion. Turn with me to page one. I begin with a simple question. What is a family altar? I like that word altar. What is a family altar? You see, an altar is a place, or it's an instrument, really a means, upon which we bring our thanksgiving offerings to the Lord. It's a place where people meet God and God meets people. I would like to think that a family altar in a home is a place where the family comes together to meet God as a unit daily, ideally, and if the meals are taken together regularly as a family or more than one person, or even if there is only one person, I would hope that the family altar would be present every time the table is spread with food. I like to see it, and I certainly encourage it, that a family altar is something that is exercised and participated in at least three times a day. Traditionally, we think of eating breakfast, 
lunch and a dinner. And every time we take time to eat, there ought to be time for asking God's blessing upon our lives as we do take. There ought to be time for the word. There ought to be time for thanksgiving. We'll get into the breakdown and some of the particulars of a family altar a little later on, but the point that I wanted to emphatically make is that the family that prays and worships together daily is a family that is really able to stay together and accomplish things together too. Though a family altar, simply, is where God meets with the family and the family meets with God. Turn the page and on page three you will notice I raise another question. These are all introductory questions to get us started so we get our minds on the right track. And I raise the question, what precedence do we have for it? Or I could rephrase the question and say, what's the value of it? There's a very fine example of it in 2 Timothy 1, verse 5. It's a well-known passage of Scripture where Paul talks to Timothy, and he says to Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you. Paul had a number of helpers in his life. Paul wrote letters to different ones. But every time I read the letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, I'm gripped with Timothy's sincerity. Timothy's faithfulness. I can always sense Paul alluding to that. Here was a special kind of man. Here was a man that had fiber way down in his life. He had character that, that was truly Christian and beautifully developed. The question is, where did Timothy get such a head start? And the answer simply is, he got it in his home. Paul says, I am reminded of your sincere faith. I don't hear Paul saying that of other people who helped him or traveled with him. This was something very particular and very unique about Timothy. A sincere faith. It was a genuine faith, through and through. I can see that when Timothy said yes to Paul, he meant yes. And I can see, too, that when Paul talked to Timothy, it was as though his eyes were sparkling, taking it in, never to miss a word, giving that look of assurance, Paul, everything you say, I shall never let you down. Well, Paul traces it back where a person can get this. And Paul says it's a faith that dwelt, first of all, in your grandmother. She handed it down to your mother, and your mother handed it down to you. We're back in the home again. Where's the fiber, and where's the character of a young person developed? Well, it's developed in the home. And what better way could you do it than to develop a family altar, a place of worship, every time you sit down to partake of food. Not just a quick prayer or the massaging of the forehead with one eye shut saying, Thank you, Lord, but the kind of family altar where there's some depth to it, where something can be learned and something can be caught and something can be gained that will shape and develop our lives. Have you ever stopped to think what's wrong with the average sermon today? It's generally an exercise where a pastor is racing through something for 15, 20 minutes, an exercise of words and an exposition of a passage, because people have well informed him ahead of time that's all time we have. On the days when I was preaching, I have always said to people, I can preach you my whole sermon in five minutes. But the problem is, when you leave this place, you aren't going to think about it. So I take 40 minutes to get across to you what I have to say, so that for 40 minutes you can turn your mind and cause it to think and ponder long enough that something will soak in, 
that by tonight your life will be a little bit different and by Monday morning it'll be a little easier because you are now a little closer to God. I shall never forget the time when I preached in a chapel in northern Arizona amongst the Navajo Indians. And when church was out, it just kind of seemed like it wasn't out. And I said to one of the bystanders there who could converse in English, I said, are people going home or is there more to come? And this was something like 11 o'clock in the morning. And he answered me this way. He said, our service doesn't end until about 8, 30, 9 o'clock tonight. He said, we spend the whole day together. They never went home. It was fellowship until the evening service, and then they had a long evening service of prayer and share and the word again. And finally, I, they take it home with them, and this becomes a part of their life. Many of the Indian Christians have an ingredient in their life that is very conducive to strong spiritual growth. That's time. They take time. Turn the page. On page five, I'll ask you another question. How influential is it? This whole thing of spending time with God as a family. It's easy to sign the children up, you know, in Bible studies at church and different kinds of Bible clubs. It's easy to send them off to Sunday school or even to take them to Sunday school. But the question still remains, is there something the home can do that the church can't do? And my answer is very emphatically, yes. You need both. But there is something the home can do that the church cannot do. The church can try substituting, but it cannot accomplish and achieve what the home can. You notice across the page we have an illustration. I have God on top, and then I have the parents, and then I have the children. And under the parents, I have in brackets the word father. A little child learns about God and basically what God is like by what the parents are like and more basically yet by what the dad is like. You see, God has a pronoun of the masculine, he. We don't say God, she. We say God, he. All right, the father is the male figure. So there's an identification there in the mind of the child. point I would like to bring out is parents, the children, are learning what God is like by your mannerisms and your attitudes in the home. And Dad, may I single you out and say, he's learning more off you than what he is off the mother. Why is it that so many people all have different ideas of what God is really like in character. Why is it that since we all read the same Bible, somebody says, what's God like? And 35 Christians all give the same answer. They don't. Reminds me of a book that was published about 20 years ago that said, tell me what your father's like and I'll tell you what your God is like. Now, many parents like to shun away from that, and many fathers feel it's a little ridiculous to think that way. Well, the fact of the matter is, while it's terribly frightening to think that our ill behavior has such adverse effect on our children, it should be tremendously gratifying and rewarding to us as parents that if we did the right thing, we could make such a tremendous impact on the children. You see, one person grows up and said, God's a striking God. He's always waiting to get you. He's just waiting for you to do wrong, and then zap, he gets you. The next one comes along and says, no, I don't think so. God's very gracious. The next one said, he's very patient. The next one said, he's very loving. The next one says he's very unforgiving. The next one says, I don't think God can, can really forget after he forgives. And you see, you get all of these different kinds of settings. Might sound rather ridiculous, but I used to experiment with this when I was working with university students. It was interesting how their concepts of God coincided with their concepts of home. In fact, I found more often than not 
that the university student who was rebelling, who in his younger years was brought up within the confines of the church, was a student who had a sad home situation. And more often than not, which is very typical of our sinful human nature, what somebody down here does to us, we seem to delight in giving God the blame for it. So rebelling students who throw away their Christianity quite often had it short-circuited in the parent figure. The home is very influential yet today. Turn to page 7. I bring us a little closer to our theme so I can show you some very important aspects of developing our walk with God. And I raise this question, what does it mean to walk with God? Well, first of all, it means that parents have learned how to live a day at a time. Because God cares, you just don't have to put it all together at once. You can let things work out because God is in your life and God is working it out for you. And secondly, it is to teach this through example, how that God also cares for children and is interested in their problems, even the problems at school. Well, let's back up just a moment. What does it really mean to walk with God? I often think of the well-known 23rd Psalm, when the psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death. He looks at the trials of life. Death is on every side, threatening him. The jaws of death are yawning, waiting to come down on him. It has always struck me with interest that he did not say, Yea, though I run through the valley of the shadow of death. Many people are running through life with fears. And the psalmist very appropriately informed us with accuracy that the way to go through the shadow of death, the way to go through the trials, the tribulations, the problems of life is not to run to walk. I have never known God to run. Why should he? He's the author of time. He holds time in his hands. He holds life in his hands. He has it all in his hands. There's, there's no need for him to run. There is nothing for him to beat. He owns, controls, governs, maintains, what do you want to say? He has it all in his hands. So even in the terrible situations of death, destruction, there is no need to run and wish that tomorrow we're here. A walk takes it a step at a time, a moment at a time, an hour at a time, a day at a time. Never need hurry. That's what I believe it means to walk with God. Quit getting up ahead. I see people outside of the family of faith walking without God. Walking, well, I see them stumbling, falling, blooding themselves, messing up their life. Then I come within the family of God and I see a tendency to hurry, to quick. Got to go fast. It has to get over with. We have to solve it now. God says, what for? Life is like a train that just has more box cars to it. There are always more situations, there are always more faith situations, always more trust situations, always more things you can't solve. Life is a succession of these. That's the value of faith. God says, walk, a step at a time. 
When you go a step at a time, that's a pace that children can keep up with. That's a pace that old people can keep up with. It's the teenage and the middle-aged people that have difficulty because they always want to run. God says, walk. How can we instill some of this in our lives? How can we deepen our relationship with God? How can we come to a more meaningful relationship with him that we can master this walk concept? And here we're going to turn the page now to page 9, and we're going to take the pyramid... Obviously, we're going to build the pyramid from bottom up. However, so we know where we are going, we start on top. And the first thing I like to have you note that the object or the objective that we are striving for in all of this to walk with God is that we gain peace. Peace. Sure, you've heard the story, but it comes back to me uh, again and again. Of the man who said to the two artists, paint me a picture of peace. And the one artist painted a beautiful metal and the sun shining and just a tiny breeze and a little, the birds were flying around and everything was just the perfect little setting. And, and when the person who had asked or given the assignment came along, looked at it, he said to him, is this your idea of peace? And he said, yes, when everything is in its place and going just right. Came to the other artist who had a cliff in the side of a mountain in the rocks. The storm was blowing, the wind was raging. And underneath a little ledge was a little nest. On the nest was a little bird chirping securely, protected from the storm. And he said, that's peace. Peace is not something people have when there is no war and lose when there is war. Peace is not something you have when you're rich and that you don't have when you're in need. Peace is a quality of life that you either have it or don't have it. If you have it, you have it in every circumstance of life, and if you don't have it, it will be absent in every circumstance of life. To learn to walk with God and to relate to him is the life of peace. I think the best way I can describe this to you is to take an illustration or two from what I hear Scripture teaching me. In fact, I have worked on it for many years now in my Christian life in an effort to perfect it, to master this whole concept of being able to walk with God with peace. I have drawn it from the different passages that indicate a rather beautiful teaching, but often very misunderstood. And that is that Jesus is Lord, and if he's Lord then I am servant or slave. I like the idea of slave, master and slave. Now, I grant you that in the earlier years of my Christian life, when I was not as mature as what I claim to be now, this used to really turn me off. Who wants to be a slave of all things? Until one day, the Lord broke through my thinking and got some things turned around, so I started to see things differently. Isn't a slave's life really, if he has a good master, a beautiful life? And I started delineating what the benefits were that a slave had. Number one, a slave never has to make a decision. A slave carries no responsibility. A slave doesn't have to wonder where where his next meal's coming from. He doesn't have to wonder where his uh, next night is going to be spent. A slave doesn't have to, in our society, wonder how he's going to pay the bills. The master does all this. All the slave has to do is listen to the master and do well what the master has given him to do. Isn't that simple? To walk with God. 
And as I pondered this, and the Lord showed this to me, it enriched my life so tremendously that in the last years I have been holding on to this, and I have tremendous peace in it. God sets me on a task and a ministry to do this, that, and I say, oh, Lord, where are the finances coming from, and how in the world are we ever going to get this all done? And then I say to myself, I'm asking too many questions. I'm the slave. He's the master. Those are his problems. It's my job to work. I guess I better get back to work. I do. And amazingly enough, everything has always worked out. Amazing? Well, that just shows how little faith we have in our God when we say it's amazing. Some people say, we saw the miracle of it working. Well, that's not a miracle. God says, I, I had that promised all the time. That's my normal way of working. When I undertake, I, I have things work out. That's not a miracle. That's the normal way with me. I ought to put a smile on your face if you think about the times you've stumbled along yourself. How are we going to build that and get up to the crescendo of peace? Go to page 11. We notice on the bottom there, and I'm going to take you through a number of things now, actually seven of them, and due to our time we're going to try to just limit it right down to the very most pertinent thoughts for each so that you can go back and you can discuss these one at a time. In communication, I think of prayer. The basis of a Christian's life is prayer. Students have often asked me, how often should a Christian pray? And I've always said to them, Praying is something like a person's heartbeat. If the heart begins to skip beats and become irregular and the doctor's taking the pulse and you say to the doctor, how is he doing? And he says, well, the heart is giving out. It won't be long. I always said to students, if you want to know how much and how often you ought to pray, it's as simple as this. When your prayer light starts skipping beats, it's like a heart skipping beats. It won't be long. You can't live without prayer. Now there's something very interesting about prayer. Who talks, who listens? Now, I've been to a lot of prayer meetings, and it seems like in prayer meetings, people are always talking to God. And it seems like that prayer meetings are heavily characterized. We've got to keep talking because God isn't going to say anything anyway. The Lord has shown me many years ago that one of the most beautiful things in prayer is to sit and listen and let God talk. Prayer is communication. If you have never done this, may I encourage you to start now. Get alone. Spend time with God. Talk to him when you have things to say, and say it in ordinary language. Don't come out with great, big, heavy theological structures. But just say it like it is, and also be ready to sit back and listen. God will answer. I have often had all-night prayer meetings with God. Was I talking all night? You asked me the question, what did I have to say that I could keep praying all night? I didn't. I simply sat back in, in the quietness of the home in a chair, and I talked with God and moved some of the burdens of my heart, and God would speak back with me, and I would talk with God, and he would talk with me. You know, we just don't believe God can talk, do we? Well, it's because we don't listen. Listen. He's probably talking to you right now. Turn the page. What's the good of the talking? The prayer. The listening. Well, to understand God. Do you really understand God? When I think about understanding God, I think about understanding the will of God, the will of God for my life. Now, we saw an awful lot of revolution and rot in our country in the late 60s and early 70s. It's when the visionary so-called 
new generation was going to show us how to put America on the map and get democracy on its feet. Never saw such a mess. In fact, that group has a very high incidence of suicide today. Apparently the vision quit if they ever had one. But at the same time, we saw a lot of things come through on the Christian front, too. In other words, the winds of the world blew through the church as though the windows were open on both sides. And Christian thought was severely affected. And one thing I heard so often in many of the Christian movements and the spirited movements was that when you surrender your life to the Lord, you'll never have another problem. He'll solve all your problems. And I've heard testimonies that were, that made me feel like I was clean out of faith. Only six months later when I heard them tell them again they sound so defeated, I said I've never been there either. There was no reality in them. We heard other statements, and that is if you're really walking in the will of God, you won't have any conflicts in your life. Now you stop and think about that one. The world in which we live and are trying to live out the will and desires of God is a sinful world ravished by the devil. Now, I can't think of a more abnormal place to live out the will of God than on this sinful earth. In other words, I'm saying if you're going to walk in the will of God and wear the cloak of righteousness, there's going to be conflict. The will of God isn't going to be easy. Put it simply, you're going to have problems. Not problems without an answer, but you're going to have problems. That's all there's to it. The will of God is not a popularity kick. When I heard many Christians just proclaiming and shouting from their platforms in housetops how that the will of God was the easy glide through life, well, I thought about the song that says, Must I be carried to the sky on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? or how I thought that the Russian Christians must have been having difficulty with American theology at that time, when American Christians were walking on the wings of whatever it was, and the Russian being tormented for his faith in the communistic jail cell was wondering what had happened. The will of God, to understand God, is to walk in his will and to walk in his will and ways. is a beautiful walk and a rewarding walk, and it's one that gives you peace. But there will be conflict. Do you understand that? Turn the page. We notice the next step up is acceptance. To be able to accept God's purpose. And the question is, when we talk about a purpose, are we willing to take the one that God has in mind for our life, though it be suffering? Or is the purpose we're trying to get out of life, is, is it one where God ought to understand? Quite a difference there. A lot of prayers are prayed in such a way that, Lord, we're going to keep telling you what we want and how we want it and how it has to happen and how soon it has to happen. And remember, Lord, we will spell it out so you can do it. And I've seen those feverish prayer meetings. And how well I remember the man who told me his story of how he walked with God and had dedicated himself to God arose every morning at 4 a.m. to spend two hours with God on his knees in the prayer room at church. And when he got all through telling about all his dedication, he said to me, and this was during a noon luncheon, do you know that at 1.30 today I have an appointment with an attorney to file bankruptcy? wonder... We usually think about God's got nothing but prosperity in mind. I wonder if 
when we pray the will and purpose of God in our lives in conversation, if we can accept that sometimes God gets his pleasure done through what we call defeat. We often think we need the healthy body and the sound mind to really be able to do things to get the will and purpose of God done. But how well I remember when I was seriously ill a good number of years ago, a pastor stood at the foot end of my hospital bed and said, Al, I've been hearing all over the city about your testimony from people who have seen you. And he said, the pulpit of this sick bed is probably a more powerful pulpit than you'll ever have in health. And I've never forgotten that. If you're going to be sick by God's plan, do it with all your heart and do it with all your might because even that can be in the will of God. Walk with him. To walk with him does not require a healthy body. The next page is trust. To trust God means let go. How do you work life out? Is it one of these things, Lord, I'll... Uh, trust you with this much of my life, but I'm not really going to trust you with more because uh, I'm not sure I can trust you, or I'm not sure you're going to do it my way. At best, most of us are still immature, selfish, helpless little children. For when it comes to trusting God, it means to let go. Let's reminisce these four. If you're having difficulty in accepting the purpose of God and trusting the will of God, it's because your prayer life and your understanding of God hasn't been worked carefully enough. Go back and work those two because everything from there on has to be automatic. And if it's not automatically working, it means you have to go back and rework those particular areas. There's another little section in this pyramid that stands as a unit. And that is on page 19 we have the word faith. We go now to what we often call the more spiritual characteristics of a Christian life, but I would like to say everything down below is very spiritual too. But anything but anyway, what is faith in the Christian life? And I would like to say it's his pair of eyes. A person with tremendous faith is a person with farsightedness, great vision, spiritually. It strikes me with interest that most people think that God works faith only through our feelings. I did what I did because I feel or felt I should do it that way. I wonder if you have ever stopped to think that part of our personality is also our thinking system. And when God affects us and works on us, he works us in our feeling life, but also our thinking life. He works them together. I've often said to university students, you can't reason out faith, yet faith is very reasonable. You can't always reason out what God asks of you, yet what God does ask of us is very reasonable. And a faith walk with God is not a walk off into fantasy land. It's a walk toward reality. God didn't make reality. God is reality. And the Christian who walks by faith toward him is the person who is on a reality walk or a walk of real living which says very simply by logical deduction that a person who does not walk with faith and does not know God is phony. And the harder he acts out not being phony, the phonier he is. For only the Christian can be true and real. Page 21, we add hope. What is hope? Well, hope is a powerful stimulation in the Christian life. You see, faith looks out and says, hey, 
I see it. Hope says that makes sense. That's right. I'm excited. It's there. And hope is sort of what leaps up in a person and says, it's there. Let's go. Now we turn the page to page 23 and we add the word love. And love is the, the tie that takes the heart and ties it all together. And it's a tie that binds us to the Father. Love is so beautiful. There are no threats in it, no gimmicks to it. It's always there. Storms, disappointment, cannot rub it out, wear it out, destroy it. Love in its truest form as derived from God is indestructible. So there's faith, hope, love. To see it, to get excited about it, and the tie that binds the heart to it, what we see. Love. All of these climax in what? Peace. I like to conclude this by getting back again to the personal as well as the family devotion. On page 25, I would like to give you just some simple steps for a family devotion. I have often led people to the Lord, and the adult has said to me, how do you pray when you pray? I never grew up in a praying home. I don't know anything about it. How do you pray? What do you say? Very realistic questions. What does a person say? And I usually go through and give them a simple little format for a nice family devotion and say to them, you won't get it all going at once. Take a little time to develop it. A good family devotion consists of three things at least. One, to read the Word. Now, there's two ways to do that. One is to read the Bible. If there are small children there, there are many fine Bible story books in the market, and the more pictures that are in it and the more colorful they are, the greater impact it'll have on the child's life. If you want to out-impact television, then work with some of the exciting visual illustrations and pictures that the Christian community is developing for the little eyes of a child. I take one little devotional book that we had in our home that's full of pictures. It was designed for the little eyes, and we wore out three or four of those raising our family. So first of all, read the Word. Secondly, pray. And dads, there's nothing finer than to hear you pray. And when you pray, don't get in the rut of just a plain old canned prayer, but put life into pr your prayer and put prayer into living. How else can we put it together? Pray aloud and at other times have the whole family share in it by doing sentence prayers. And thirdly, the long forgotten art that is more powerful, more educational, more influential probably than anything you can do, and that's sing. Sing the psalms and sing the hymns around the table. Reading the word is fine, but you see only one person is really active in it. The rest of the people can be wandering down the street in their minds. Praying is great, especially there's impact in it if we are all participating in the sentence prayer. But when it comes to singing, you can't sit by. This is where all meet and blend together. And there are many fine Christian lessons in the words of the hymn writers. Don't miss those. And study a little hymnology so that you get the content and what occasion some of the thoughts behind it. And then on page 27, I put just one word down, and that's discussion. And that simply means have a little time and take a little time where you can talk about the everyday things of life and integrate them into your relationship with the Lord. For after all, in the end, the one thing you hope for is that your children with you will walk with the Lord. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for our home and family. 
Enable us to walk with you in love and service. Be present with us each time we meet. Amen.